Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts, of George Mason University and Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, find other episodes, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Before introducing today's guest, I want to encourage all of you listening out there to fill out a brief survey about EconTalk. Just go to our homepage, econtalk.org, and in the upper left-hand corner, just under the photo of me, is a link to the survey. Please click it, fill out the survey, so we can continue to make EconTalk better. My guest today is Vernon Smith, Professor of Economics and Law at Chapman University, Professor Emeritus at George Mason University and a Nobel Laureate. His latest book and the subject of today's conversation is Rationality in Economics. Vernon, welcome back to Econ Talk. Uh, hi, Ross. I'm very happy to be back. Your new book is an incredible overview of what I would call the essence of economics. How do people think, behave, choose, trade? What we've learned and have yet to learn from the experimental economics approach that you've pioneered. And at the heart of the book are two different concepts of what it means to be rational, a distinction you take from Hayek, a distinction between constructivist and ecological rationality. And I'd like to start by talking about each of those in turn. What what do you mean by constructivist rationality? Well, by that, I mean to simply characterize the way we tend to think about problems traditionally in economics, whether we're mathematically oriented or not, uh, we tend to think in terms of models that we we construct. And, you know, the good example is the paper and pencil model of supply and demand, and that we all use and and use very, and and try to give it life, I think, with various uh, stories. Uh, and but one of the things which bothered me in traditional economics and led me to do experiments was that I found it difficult to understand the connection between the way we tell the supply and demand story and what it is that people do actually do in markets and 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 sort of how it looks from their perspective and experiments represented one way to do this. I wouldn't claim it's the only way to do it. There are certainly all kinds of... uh, Rush in your own teaching. You're you're very good at trying to give it life in terms of people's experience. And and so uh, that kind of an approach, I think, helps a great deal. What I turned to was the idea of doing, constructing a laboratory experiment using the constructivist model and then borrowing from the world out there one of the trading institutions with a well-defined message space and 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 a structure, which, by the way, is not part of economic theory. Certainly it wasn't then. Uh, And then I asked, uh, will people will be able to find the equilibrium in that market uh, without knowing what we know as economists, without having the information that I had in constructing the, uh, uh, the experiment, will people be able to do it? And what astonished me was that they did. And it no longer astonishes me, (laughs) but it did then from the perspective of, you know, 1955, 1956, brought up uh, with a very good but standard uh, education, Harvard education. And, And that's what launched me then into experimental economics as a research project, although it began as really a teaching exercise. But when you say that participants in these experiments 
head toward equilibrium and achieve it with a limited amount of information. And what the limited amount of information they have is what you've told them is their payout as a buyer or a seller. And by equilibrium, you mean they tend to eventually make transactions at a price that has a set of properties that come from that supply and demand framework. Right. And the information that they had in the original experiments, and and these have been replicated hundreds, probably thousands of times, uh, is simply their own private information representing, if they're buyers, the maximum amount they would be willing to pay uh, with the understanding, they, of course, that they would earn a profit equal to the difference between that maximum they're willing to pay and the price they actual pay, actually pay in the market. And so the whole idea was to enable them to, to enjoy what, in traditional economics, we call the consumer surplus from demand. And then symmetrically, uh, you know, I, I gave minimum willingnesses to accept or, or, or opportunity costs to the sellers, and they profited by selling uh, above that. And then people were motivated because very early on I started to use actual cash payoff to, uh, f- uh, um, d- depending upon their, their profits, uh, related directly to their profits in, in the experiment. Uh, so that, uh, that was the, the experimental design, which was motivated by the elementary theory of supply and demand. That is what I mean by a constructivist uh, model. And in that, that model predicts that if people behave rationally as profit maximizers, they will uh, maximize the surplus generated in the market and they'll produce an equilibrium in price and and quantity or volume of exchange as predicted by the supply and demand model. And they do that. And I was... uh, I'm actually surprised that that's the example you've chosen of constructivist rationality because the way I understood it in the book, you were talking about the use of reason to solve problems and that For example, constructivist policy would be an attempt to rationally design the best institutions. Is is that a fair reading also? Yes. Uh, I just gave one of many examples, but the the constructivist model, which of supply and demand, took the economics profession uh, about a century to find after Adam Smith was writing. And to and to get um, kind of a of a straight view as to how it might be that preferences are expressed in demand and and production costs are expressed in in supply and and that is a a way of simplifying reality out there in order to get try to get an understanding of what it would mean for a market to reach a competitive equilibrium and what it might mean for that to be uh, a good thing in terms of of, uh, social welfare. So I, I see it now. So you're saying supply and demand is an intellectual construct that we use to simplify reality. And of course... It doesn't really exist. It's just one way we capture this extraordinary set of interactions of buying and selling. Exactly. That has an orderliness and rationality to it. Yes, and we used reason quite intensively <laughs> in order to reach that uh, that level of, uh, of modeling. We as theorists. We as theorists. But the puzzle then would be why the individual transactors in those interactions either in the experiments that you've conducted or out in the real world uh, 
have much less limited use of their reason when they're out there doing their, their, the best they can, and yet it turns out that the entire system is surprisingly rational. Right. And, the, and, and you know, we, it isn't that people didn't worry some about how a market might actually get into equilibrium. For example, Voros originally... Uh, conceived the idea of an auctioneer who would try out different prices and discovered that at some prices there was excess supply and at other prices there was excess demand and then this groping process would lead to finding the equilibrium and then everyone would trade. Well, that was an imaginary construct which... uh, no one uh, uses out there in the real world. I guess the gold-fixing market comes the closest to that. If you look at how that is done, uh, they do try out prices uh, among the gold dealers in in London before they latch on to the price, uh, fix the price, which then clears the market. But it's not the way we... We see people uh, exploring markets out there, and so what I did in the first experiment I did, that I conducted was use the oral outcry double auction and a, a bid ask market. And those markets, of course, are enormously popular. They were then, and now they're just all, you know all over the world. Uh, currency markets and stock markets, commodity markets, everywhere use use that uh, mechanism. And then subsequently, I also looked at other kinds of institutions, like, for example, where sellers post take it or leave it prices, the kind of thing that we see in ordinary retail markets. And those converge too, although they tended to take somewhat longer period of time. Um, <clears throat> so those are all uh, kind of, that's one way of representing kind of constructivism. And, 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 and you mentioned policy. Well, yes. Uh, um, policies in economics are often based upon some, uh, on our models of of economics, and then we introduce some kind of of policy variables, and we ask what is the best way to set those. And again, all very much an abstract uh, exercise, which leaves open the question as to how it is they might actually work in the world, and and how we determine best. Um, right, we're trying to design the best policy. Um, but the best policy, any policy, is usually going to affect us all differently. And so how we choose between those is a problem that economics has struggled with. I don't find the answers particularly satisfying the way I did when I was in graduate school, but um, I don't know where you stand on that. Well, I quite agree, and and one, one of the problems that happens in, in economic policy is that people assume they can intervene in some way and and make the world better, but people will not change their fundamental ba- baseline behavior as a result of that intervention. Um, you, you see, well, you see it right now. Congress is moving ahead to do some kind of bailout of the uh, home industry, the, the, the mortgage and uh, uh, and the distress in the um, um, both the mortgage market and, and directly in the housing market. Uh, but that will almost certainly have future consequences in the sense that why should you? worry about being cautious in the loan market if you come to believe that if things go awry, the government will uh, bail you out. So there's really a moral hazard problem here from the government's perspective of making things worse down the the line. And almost 
inevitably, people don't think about that, or at least not very deeply, when they um, come in and want to look, do something about the current situation to make it better for the individuals who are experiencing distress. If they do think about it deeply, they keep it to themselves, I think. <laughs> don't want to point it out too often. Now, let's turn to this idea of ecological, ecological rationality. What do you mean by that? Uh, well, returning to the supply and demand model, uh, it turns out that people find these equilibria if they have a chance to uh, engage in repeat and repeat trade over time, uh, and they achieve the uh, the best state predicted by that supply and demand market model, and they achieve uh, very closely approximate the uh, volume of exchange and the prices predicted by that model. Uh, that is an example of a, what I mean by an ecological equilibrium in which people, using their own devices, uh, communicating through whatever the trading institution is, that, that, uh, and there's many of them defined out there, uh, they're able to achieve rational outcomes, and in that in the supply and demand case, we can say that is a rational outcome because we have a model that, exp- that uh, tells us why it is a rational outcome. And even though the real world may be more complicated, for example, uh, the supply and demand is actually a moving target, <laughs> shifting around out there, no doubt, all the time. Um, Nevertheless, this gives you uh, an illustration of how the, the information that we model by the use of reason is somehow aggregated out there in, these, in this example of the experiments is aggregated by individuals to produce an outcome that's completely equivalent to the rational theoretical uh, uh, model. What's interesting is that the subjects in one of these experiments can't really model themselves. You, you know, I've, <laughs> I often ask, when I use this as a teaching exercise, uh, the students have found the competitive equilibrium, and we show them that, that that uh, why that's the competitive equilibrium. We show that nobody could have done any better for himself given what everybody else was doing. That's exactly what you mean by an equilibrium. And I often ask them, well, now how did you do this? Well, there's just blank stares. And I ask them, can you model yourself? Well, they can't do it. You know, they... <laughs> Humans have this incredible ability to to function in rule governed uh, systems that's been I think demonstrated over and over again in experiments and there's all kinds of real world parallels out there. Um, but it is extremely difficult to model the details of that process. It's uh, you know, it's fashionable in economics to talk about now to talk about people being bounded rationality, being being b- boundedly rational. I like to talk about the bounded rationality of theorists. <laughs> this is such a challenging problem that we can't solve it. So this is a sub theme of the book, which is really quite fascinating. It reminds me a little bit of a podcast we had a while back with William Duggan, who talked about problem solving. And deep insight, sort of the, the the neuroscience of Eureka and how we solve problems. And we think of solving problems in in a constructivist way that we we as engineers. But your claim, and I think a theme that runs through the book, 
is that we solve a lot of problems in life, like how to behave in a marketplace, either simulated in an experiment or out in the real world, in ways that we don't understand ourselves, and yet manage to produce solutions or outcomes that have attractive properties, even though we don't understand how we got there. Is that a fair characterization? That's a very good uh, statement of exactly the a major theme in ecological rationality. And in my book, what I've tried to do is just provide a, a, a substantial range of examples of how this has uh, ev- evidenced itself, not only in experiments, but in many real-world examples. And one of the examples I use is after we deregulated airlines, in the 1970s, and that meant we were deregulating the routes. The airlines airlines could freely choose their routes compared with the former regulated system where they got where they were given authority to fly a route, and they had to and they had to fly that route, or they would lose lose the authority. Uh, and one of the things that sort of astonished uh, even transportation economists, was how this hub and, sco- uh, hub and spoke uh, form of organization emerged out of that deregulated uh, uh, airline industry. And, and people sort of expected that there would be more nonstop service between secondary cities. Didn't develop. Uh, it, it was n- not because there was any shortage of people trying. All kinds of attempts were m- made to do nonstop service between secondary cities. Didn't work. And and uh, subsequently, I think we came to understand that better because people have people have a, a desire for a certain for frequency of service which if it's not satisfied, they're willing to spend an extra hour going through a hub so that they can leave at a more convenient time during the day. And so there's a combination there of density of traffic, uh, consumer preferences, uh, the uh, cost of kind of the, the, the minimum profitable load factor on airplanes. It's a very complex problem and involves networks. And what's interesting is that the industry found an equilibrium there, which I think it's now possible to characterize much better uh, uh, theoretically. And so there's an example of an ecological equilibrium that wasn't anticipated by the formal models. And uh, partly because even if you formally model it, you don't know what where to set the parameters uh, so that they really reflect the reality out there. So that's I think a beautiful example of of how a profit and loss system, which with passengers free to choose. Uh, airline companies free to choose and making adjustments over time gave you uh, an equilibrium that is very robust. What I found fascinating about that example, and I'm glad you brought it up, I was going to ask you about it, is one, its relationship to Federal Express that I I want to talk about, and two, the characteristics of that equilibrium that I think a lot of people look at very negatively because they think, I don't want to go through this hub. I want a direct flight. They don't think about what it would cost to service that direct route, and so they just complain. But as you point out from the Federal Express example, which uh, was sort of a a predecessor, um, Federal Express initially sent every package through Memphis, Tennessee, I remember teaching this, making this observation to my students and in, in MBA students, and at, at uh, when I was teaching at Washington University, 
And one of them said, well, that's obviously stupid. Why would you make every package go through Memphis, Tennessee? I mean, if a package is going from Los Angeles to San Francisco, why would you send it all the way to the middle of the country and, and then back? Yeah. And I said, well, I don't know, but it strikes me that Fred Smith probably has a slightly bigger incentive than you do to figure out whether it's a good idea or not. I bet he's given it some thought. And mm-hmm. so what you point out in the book is that that hub system – saves an enormous amount of money relative, potentially, relative to a direct service route. And there's some waste, but it's waste that's well well spent. Yes. And the Fred, but what's interesting to me is that the Fred Smith idea, his insight that it can be cheaper and therefore beneficial to have every package go through Memphis because it reduces the total number of flights by an enormous factor on any given night, Yes. That that insight wasn't copied by the airlines. They didn't all just say, oh, then we should have hubs and spokes. Yes. They tried all these other different things, and hubs and spokes is what came out. Yes. And uh, that's a great uh, example. Fred Smith is an example of someone who did have the vision. And, and he and basically he had a, a constructivist model of it that was a good model, and he bet on it. He put his own money into that, and he created a, uh, a, a system that has just been in, uh, has had an incredible growth. And the interesting thing about it, it goes back to a paper he wrote as an undergraduate, I believe, at Yale, in, in which he was already talking about uh, some of the issues which he later uh, implemented in his, in his business. Uh, he didn't just put his own money in, by the way. He put his sister's money in, too, without their uh, agreeing. He was sued by them for taking money out of the family trust fund. Yeah, well, I see. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. That's really well, a, that's a lot of trust. I mean, a lot of optimism. It sure <laughs> is. And, yeah, not uh, entrepreneurs often don't use their own money, in fact, but they find people who uh, either are willing to bet on them or, in this case... <laughs> <laughs> uh, he, he was able to tap sources that he had control over. He, he used his, I don't mean to suggest he didn't use his own money. He used every penny of that. Mm-hmm. He just went went a little bit farther. Let's let's talk about um, sort of the rudiments of exchange, which you have insights in, into that, that that no one else has. I'm sorry, the rudiments of of exchange. Oh, exchange. You know, Adam Smith talked about the human propensity to truck barter and exchange. And we think of that, I think, when we when we hear that phrase, we think of our commercial side, the human propensity to shop. But it goes much deeper than that. So tell me what you mean by truck barter and exchange. Well, I have come to appreciate that it's much more uh, comprehensive than just commercial exchange. And part of it, uh, of that insight, came from experiments uh, in which people were involved in uh, two-person interactions in a structured uh, game tree, a sequential move uh, situation, and in which game theory predicted, well, uh, people will always choose, given a choice between two options, they'll always choose the, the dominant one, the one that's, great, that's best for them. And if, people, uh, and if two people follow that, that uh, rule and perform backward induction in a sequential move uh, tree they're going to play in, then there's, that game has an equilibrium. And there are better outcomes than that for the two parties if they are able to figure out a way to cooperate. In other words, uh, each uh, player, you see, may defect on an offer of cooperation by the other. And if you are are strictly self-interested, that's what you'll always do. Well, what we soon found out is that a good half of our subjects don't follow dominant strategies. 
and you can't say it's irrational because uh, these, not necessarily as individuals, but on average, the people who follow cooperative strategies make more money than those who play the equal or beam of the game. And that, in a way, sort of led me back to the theory of moral sentiments, in which, uh, and and there's some great quotes that I use in my book from from the theory of moral sentiments. That book is by Adam Smith, by the way, the theory of moral sentiments. Yes, Adam Smith. It's it's a tragedy that, that people think he wrote one great book. He wrote two great books. Yes, he wrote, and and in a sense, The Theory of Moral Sentiments was two books because he greatly, you know, he, the original, um, the uh, first edition was in 1759, if I remember correctly. He did a major rewrite of that book and finished it about six weeks before his death. So in, in many ways, <laughs> that was his first love and, and his last. And he poured a lot into that work, even though it did, never enjoyed anything like the popularity, of course, of the, of the wealth of nations. But that book, I think, has incredible insights concerning uh, the way I would interpret it as social exchange. Uh, you know, Adam Smith says, uh, who, are, who are we likely to be benevolent toward? Uh, it's the people that have been benevolent toward us in the past. He's talking about reciprocity, although he doesn't use that word. And he's talking about an exchange system and human sympathies and, and our ability to in a sense, read each other by knowing something about what we would do if we were in the situation that somebody else is in. And I, I think it's a, it's a book, that, you know, in a way the great tragedy is that that book didn't become the foundation of psychology. Mm-hmm. And I think it, the reason why it didn't is that people just weren't ready for it. Uh, it you know wasn't until a century later that psychology began to become well defined and emerge as a as a field even though much of what happened in psychology i think was very nicely anticipated by by adam smith particularly social psychology but as you point out in your book <clears throat> there's a a seeming tension between the adam smith of moral sentiments and the Adam Smith of the wealth of nations, the tension being that, and this is a parody to some extent, but it is the way people think about it, that in the theory of moral sentiments, Adam Smith said we're motivated by love and self-esteem, a desire for pride and honor, a desire to think well of ourselves and and that others think well of us, all kinds of things that are missing from most modern economic models of human behavior, whereas in The Wealth of Nations, Smith focused on self-interest, which is certainly an important part of human behavior, and some claim that those two views of the human being are contradictory, that in the one hand, you have Adam Smith saying, we're all self-interested trying to get the best possible deal, but on the other hand, we care about reciprocity and empathy and love, et cetera, in the the theory of moral sentiments. And you reconcile those two in, in your book. How, how do you do that? Well, it's, it's uh, fairly simple. I see <clears throat> the kind of trading of favors and sharing in uh, local social groups as really an exchange system, in which, and, and I would argue there's gains from that exchange. It's a form of trading system. Um, and and my, the, the, one of the views I develop in the book is the idea that surely trade originally grew out of, of these exchange systems that started in the family, the extended family, 
and grew to tribes. Uh, and I think that can be made consistent. That way of thinking is consistent with a lot of the anthropological evidence we have. What we don't know is how that may have evolved into trade with strangers uh, and ultimately uh, the use of money and very sophisticated forms of of, uh, of trade and exchange that, of course, is now, uh, ha- has now gone uh, global. And we don't have a good understanding of that because that hi- kind of that history is lost. Uh, I think an important part of it is the probably is rooted in, in religious traditions that emphasize uh, the... Uh, you know, the the great shout nots. And Haidt makes this point also. Um, you know, thou shalt not steal, covet the possessions of thy neighbor, and and so on, which are basically property right rules. And, but it's uh, expressing those rules as a form of moral behavior that people ought to follow. Uh, and of course, these kinds of moral rules early on became got captured in uh, uh, formal rules of order, and uh, became encoded in. Uh, in legal systems. Uh, but it's still true that I think those kinds of norms and uh, social exchange systems are very uh, important part of, of, of the human uh, uh, career. And they, I think, lead to some some unfortunate consequences, though, in the sense that I think that our, in our social exchange systems, we think of of good being something that do, people deliberately bring about. Uh, you see, I do good when I return your favor. And so we think of, of good acts as being deliberate. And I think that the unfortunate thing about that is that we, we carry that type of, of thinking and reasoning over when we look at markets. And we say, well, surely we can, we can improve on these markets out there. By do, we can make them do good <laughs> by intervening. And I, I think this is, helps to explain why people are constantly wanting to to improve something out there that they don't realize is is already working very effectively, and they should just leave it alone. <laughs> yep. Well, you quote you quote Hayek, and I'm going to quote him again, if I may. It's a quote we've heard before on this show. Uh, I think it's such a deep insight, and you expand on it. Here's the quote. Part of our present difficulty is that we must constantly adjust our lives, our thoughts, and our emotions in order to live simultaneously within the different kinds of orders according to different rules. If we were to apply the unmodified, uncurbed rules of the microcosmos, i.e. of the small band or troop, or of, say, our families, to the macrocosmos, our wider civilization, as our instincts and sentimental yearnings often make us wish to do, we would destroy it. Yet if we were always to apply the rules of the extended order to our more intimate groupings, we would crush them. So we must learn to live in two sorts of worlds at once. And it seems to me, that's the end of the quote, it seems to me that we're not very well equipped to live in those two sorts of worlds. It, it's nice for Hayek to, to admonish us about the dangers of trying to merge our small groups with our interactions with strangers. But I think your insight, and his as well, is that biologically we're not very well equipped for that. No, we're not. And it's uh, and the problem is 
the good that markets do is not something we experience directly as individuals. And so people constantly are interpreting markets as instruments that somehow, if I'm a buyer, somehow markets are biased in term, uh, in favor of sellers. They don't see the discipline that buyers bring to the market that sellers have to uh, take into account, and vice versa. Those things are not transparent any more than we when when I do a supply and demand experiment in a class. It's uh, transparent to the people that they're going to achieve the, uh, uh, an equilibrium state, which is uh, is going to make them best off as a group. It's not part of their experience. It's part of of our attempt to get them to understand uh, what that exercise is about uh, in the fo- you know in our follow up we we try to uh, sh- show how effectively they have just proven themselves in creating a uh, uh, an, almost an ideal state but you see they go out in the world and they don't necessarily rate, relate that to their experience. And so I quite agree. We're not well equipped because we're just, we, we have, humans have this incredible ability to solve problems that they don't really understand themselves. And it involves not only individual uh, motivations, but it involves people's, uh, kind of their social brains because uh, you see, even in, in a uh, in a double auction market, people are interacting. They may be operating to improve their own state, but they're taking into account the information in bids and offers that are being provided others by others, and they're somehow you see responding to that in a way that turns out to be dynamically uh, the right way to respond to to end up in in the predicted equilibrium which maximizes their 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 surplus well what fascinates me is your insight and observation that that people who solve problems can't explain how they do it um, which um, Leads to a certain respect, I think, for the um, the mystical nature of, of what's going on here. Uh, you, you talk in the book about neuroscience and what we've learned from neuroscience um, about the limits of our understanding of reason. And you cite Hayek, and I'm fascinated by – I've not read that work. I'm curious what Hayek contributes to that discussion – and why you bothered to read him? He, he's not a person we would think would have a lot of insight into neuroscience or the human mm-hmm. brain. Where did his insights come from? Because you clearly think that that they're worth exploring. And and what other insights do we need to understand about the brain as economists and as human beings in thinking about how we make our decisions? Well, of course, n- neuroscience is only at the beginning. And uh, at this point, it's hard to to be sure what directions it will take and what kind of insights it will bring. But I think at certain elementary levels, it has already produced some kind of interesting uh, results. Uh, For example, to give you a really simple example, uh, uh, people, of course, we know are well motivated to earn money. Uh, how does the brain encode the value of money? Well, it turns out that it encodes it the way it encodes uh, uh, items of pleasure like uh, uh, food. And the, what, uh, what the brain did was to simply, once money was introduced, uh, 
it latched on to those receptors in the brain, those, the reward centers associated with, with our basic needs. And so the brain just interprets, you know, money as, uh, as, as good, like the same as, as uh, commodities. Uh, which raises an interesting question because a question that I have uh, posed at, at one neuroeconomics conference, what happens when uh, the state debauches the money supply? <laughs> happens over, you know, over and over again where people are, create too much money, governments do, and they end up inflating the currency. Clearly, at some point, the brain must make a switch and realize that this is not the same as commodity, that its value has, uh, has uh, depreciated. It's more and, like... And, it's see, more that's like, an example of the dynamic, something that ch- could change over time where the brain would have to adapt to that. And, and, and we don't know how that's done. But it's a kind of question which I think neuroeconomics... Uh, might be able to answer in the, in the future. And should we be studying those things? I beg your pardon? Should we be studying... When you say, uh, I should let our listeners know, when you're talking about the brain treating money like food, mm-hmm. you're talking about experimental results from MRI machines and, yes. and not just asking people or speculating. You're talking about the biological yes. reflexes that we have. Exactly. The reward centers that are activated uh, when a subject is comparing uh, two desirable objects. They might, for example, be food. And this is also true in monkeys and, and apes. The same kind of reward centers exist in other uh, mammals. Uh, turns out the same areas are activated when people are comparing uh, situations that involve monetary uh, monetary payoff. And, and, and by the way, there's an, even an activation, but it's weak. If it's not real money, but you, but you just speak of actions that would lead, that would be more valuable in terms of money that's not actually paid to you, Turns out there's still a weak activation. It, it's just stronger if there's real money involved. <laughs> it's, like so smell, things like, it's like smelling the food. <laughs> yeah. So things like this, you see, have actually been uh, documented, documented at an elementary level, which I think is is going to be part of the building blocks that are that will perhaps be coming out of uh, of neuroeconomics and the study of you know the imaging of people's brains when they're making decisions and choosing. So where does this leave us as economists and as human beings in thinking about what motivates people? When I say this, I mean our whole conversation. The, the, the mainstream textbook model of economic man is uh, a utility maximizer subject to the constraint of income. We might toss in there now and then a little bit of altruism. You might care about something other than yourself. But do you believe that that's the right way to teach people economics? That's the right way to think about economics? Well, I guess I would temper it with a a healthy dose of reading from Adam Smith and the Theory of Moral Sentiments. Because I think that that model has been a very good one, and, and the economists were right to pursue it. Um, but I think also there's a lot of value in in looking at humans as uh, as creatures that are have uh, connections with each others through non-market uh, processes. That are an important have been an important part of the development of the of the human uh, career, and I think the um, 
there's a there's a there are rich possibilities of understanding better, I think, the economic model by uh, introducing some of these other considerations and and being in a, a, essentially more multidisciplinary than we have been in the past. Uh, and I, I just think there's <clears throat> uh, not that all economists should now become multidisciplinary. My point is simply that I think, particularly in uh, in the level of both uh, education and basic research, that we uh, it's important to expose that economic model to broader some of the broader considerations that we've been talking about in this uh, in this interview. At the end of the book, you say something rather um, extraordinary, um, and it's what caused me to refer to a, almost a mystical understanding of markets uh, a few minutes ago. You say you're talking about the prices that emerge from our truck bartering, trucking, bartering, and exchanging are, are these interactions uh, face-to-face in markets. And you say, quote, we can never fully understand how this process works in the world because the required information is not given or available to any one mind. It's a certain um, recognition. That's the end of the quote. It's a certain recognition of, of the limits of of human reason in grasping the rationality of a system that is greater than any of the individual participants. I'd like you to talk about that and and where it leaves us for evaluating good policy, if you can. To me, it leads to a very agnostic uh, result by traditional economic methods, and it requires us to use other methods to me yes. to evaluate. So, do you agree with that? Yes, and I think, uh, well, I, I think this points to really the important role of of freedom in our society because it's it's through freedom that people are able to discover new ways of connecting. Uh, creating of new institutions uh, and those institutions are tend to be very much influenced by uh, technology I mean you know just look what's happening now in in the uh, communication computer revolution the the possibilities for people to link up formally through markets or informally through all kinds of other means of communication, blogs, for example. Uh, I think this is is an enormously enriching uh, opportunities that have been created by this new by by the new technologies. But I don't think. But it's it's always been so. That is, I think, you know, technologies have always been an important part of of human uh, uh, achievement, and it's going clear back to, you know, why did our ancestors walk out of Africa fifty odd thousand years ago? Uh, they had the tools to do it. <laughs> Right. And you know, and they uh, they ultimately settled the entire uh, planet, uh, and, and this and 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 that migration was pretty well completed by a thousand years ago. That's when New Zealand was was settled by uh, by humans, the Polynesians. And that's 500 years before the before the uh, square rigger sailing ship had been invented. That's that's astonishing. Yep. <laughs> you know, after the square rigger, it was we had all kinds of rediscoveries happening. Uh, 
and and I think that was very much driven uh, by uh, by entrepreneurial spirit in humans, an inventive spirit, which is where the technology comes in, and an ability to to create. Uh, social connections that in in tribes that made that made those tribes powerful uh, investigators of the unknown, and I think th- that's been around an important part of the human career from its earliest beginnings, and, and now it's just being le- hugely le- leveraged uh, almost as we speak by by a tremendously uh, uh, a tremendous growth in in uh, technology. Well, having seen the movie The March of the Penguins, it's clear why Antarctica was left alone by human beings, and it's even a bit of a puzzle as to why those penguins are still there. It looks like a very unpleasant life, but it is the exploratory aspect of the human enterprise is really a glorious thing, and it I think we, as you point out, we've populated almost all of the globe, and now we've turned to the interior world of the human mind, the role of of information and knowledge and creativity. It's the last frontier, and it's the frontier that will never be closed. Yes. Yes, and you know, uh, Hyde made, raised an interesting question, which I have repeated, uh... And that is, can the mind understand itself? And, you know, it's not clear that it can, because we're talking about cases where the mind, the brain, our neurophysiological system is able to do things in interacting with others that we find very hard to penetrate with any kind of, of constructivist uh, modeling, and there it is. It's we enjoy it. It's been there for a long time, and it just is is continuing to to develop. Well, we're, we're almost out of time. I want to ask you one more thing. Okay. Um, there, there is a long trend in Western civilization, especially among the intellectual elite, to argue that markets market processes, commercial activity is essentially degrading. Uh, It's bad for the soul. It destroys uh, community. And I have some future guests scheduled who are going to talk on both sides of that issue. But I wanted to give, to hear your take uh, briefly in in thinking about the following question. Do you believe that markets or even the study of economics, which is also indicted in some of these treatments, uh, is degrading, that it leads to a diminishing of, of our humanity. Does Do markets destroy virtue? No. I think that's a wrong-headed view. I think uh, the commercial enterprise in the human career has been just as important and valuable as as the art enterprise, the po- poetry enterprise. I mean, humans have incredible uh, skills and abilities, and that that across the spectrum in art and music and commerce, they're all they all reflect who we are and what we are. As humans, and the thing about the commercial enterprise is that it's, it's it's an engine of wealth creation that enables people to, to it ena- through the surplus generated. It enables people to do art and music and engage in all of these activities that uh, intellectuals. I, I will agree with you. Many think are some, somehow superior to the commercial. 
But I see these as all just re- kind of r- remarkable ins- uh, examples of human ingenuity. And I don't think you can take any part of it away and say that somehow humans are better off if you could, if you could uh, uh, do away with that part, in particular the uh, commercial activities. My guest today has been Vernon Smith. Vernon, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.